Good morning. As the Secretary of the Energy and Environmental Markets Advisory Committee, it is my pleasure to call this meeting to order. Welcome to the second EMAC meeting of 2021. It marks the seventh meeting with Commissioner Berkowitz as a sponsor of the committee. In light of the global response to COVID-19, we are holding today's meeting by the video conference to continue to protect the safety of agency personnel, the EMAC members, and EMAC associate members, and the public. To ensure that today's virtual meeting goes as smoothly as possible and the recording of the meeting is complete and accurate, please identify yourself before you begin speaking, including when you are done speaking. Please speak directly into your phone for optimal audio quality on the webcast. Please unmute and your phone and your WebEx video before you speak and mute both after you speak. Please turn to your... Please only turn on your camera when you are pre presenting or engaging in the Q&A after the panel. If you would like to be recognized during the discussion for a question or comment or need technical assistance, please message me within the WebEx chat. I will alert EMAC Chair Dina Wiggins that you would like to speak during the Q&A that follows the prepared remarks and presentations. If you're disconnected from WebEx, please close your browser and enter WebEx again using the link that I previously provided for today's meeting. Before we begin this morning's discussion, I would like to turn to Commissioner Berkowitz for his opening remarks. Good morning and welcome to the Energy and Environmental Markets Advisory Committee meeting. I'm very pleased to see you all by video today. Last month, a panel of scientists convened by the United Nations issued a landmark report warning of the dire effects of climate change. The report unequivocally linked the Earth's warming to human activities and called for urgent action to significantly reduce emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Derivatives markets, and particularly those for carbon allowances and offsets, have an important role to play in achieving these reductions. They can help companies optimize emissions reductions, protect against the financial risks associated with global climate change, and manage the risks arising from the transition to a carbon neutral economy. This past June, this committee met to examine the role of carbon markets in the transition to a carbon neutral economy. We heard from leaders of cap and trade programs in the United States and abroad, from our US-based exchanges that offer carbon derivative products, and from market participants and other stakeholders with experience in carbon markets. At our June meeting, EMAC Associate Member Matt Picardi, on behalf of the Commercial Working, excuse me, the Commercial Energy Working Group, proposed that the EMAC take a closer look at how the Commission can support this energy transition by examining the design of carbon markets. Mr. Picardi recommended that the Commission establish a subcommittee, this committee, to examine the interplay between secondary cash markets for carbon allowances and offsets and the derivatives markets for those products, with the goal of promoting uniformity across the very markets and enhancing liquidity. The committee is meeting today to discuss this proposal, and we will call for a vote at the end of the meeting. Should members recommend the establishment of a subcommittee and the recommendation is approved by the commission, the CFTC would then publish a request in the Federal Register for subcommittee nomination. As we do with our EMAC membership, we would strive for a subcommittee comprised of a broad and diverse range of viewpoints. Membership on the subcommittee would not be limited to those who are already members or associated members of EMAC. So I urge all interested stakeholders with expertise in and experience with these issues to submit a nomination. Subcommittee members would be tasked with defining the mission of the subcommittee and ultimately preparing a report to the EMAC, setting forth guiding principles for the design of carbon markets, as well as addressing any other topics that the subcommittee deems relevant to its mission. I'm very much looking forward to a robust discussion today and to any further action recommended by the EMAC members. As I announced last week, I will be leaving the commission next month. One of the things I'll miss most about my time as a commissioner is sponsoring this advisory committee and working with each of you in your capacity as members and associate members of the EMAC. Some of you I've known for decades and others I have been fortunate to meet when you were nominated to the EMAC. And I've gotten to know you over the months and years since and I'm grateful for each of these relationships. I would like to thank all of you for the contributions you have made over the years to educate and inform the commission and the public 
about issues important to our energy and environmental markets. I never cease to be impressed with your dedication and enthusiasm and the wealth of knowledge and experience you bring to this committee on a voluntary basis. I wish we could be together in Washington today so I could speak to each of you individually, but I look forward to continuing to stay in touch. I would like to thank all the people who have made these meetings such a success. First, thank you to Acting Chair Benham and Commissioner Stump for participating in today's meeting, as well as your ongoing and unwavering support for the EMAC throughout my tenure. My relationships with both of you over the past three years have only strengthened, and the public is fortunate to have such dedicated public servants overseeing our financial markets. I would also like to thank Dina Wiggins, who has chaired this committee for the first for the full three years of my sponsorship. She brings her deep experience in the energy markets to her role as chair, and the EMAC has greatly benefited from her leadership. I am very grateful to Abigail Knopf for her exceptional work as secretary of the EMAC. Abigail volunteered for this role in, her, in addition to her day job, the Division of Clearing and Risk and has planned thoughtful and informative meetings and has worked individually with, with each of you on issues vital to our energy and environmental markets. I also have deepest thanks for Lucy Hines on my staff, for all of her staff working with the membership on, my, on behalf of my office and supporting Abigail in, the planning meet, in planning these meetings. And finally, many thanks to Michelle Gim in the legal division for her counsel to the committee over the years, and to RT and our IT and facility staff who have made these remote meetings appear so seamless. Much work has gone into these meetings that is not visible. I just would like to thank everybody uh, for participating and contributing, again, on a voluntary basis above and beyond the call of your ordinary duties and responsibilities to the commission and uh, your interest in the private sector. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Abigail. Thank you, Commissioner Berkowitz. I now recognize Acting Chairman Benham to give his opening remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, Abigail, um, and good morning to everybody on the EMAC. It's great to be here. Uh, first off, I want to thank Abigail for her leadership and, and Dean and Wiggins as well. Um, and of course, to Commissioner Berkowitz, um, you thank Commissioner Stump and I, but we, we need to thank you more, more importantly. Um, your leadership on this committee has been outstanding for the past three years, but in many respects, the issues that you've elevated and raised um, since you've taken over the EMAC have been issues that you've cared deeply about for many, many years. And your, your time in public service has stretched several decades, um, but your commitment to the CFTC has also been um, sort of ever-present uh, for the past almost 15 to 20 years. And in many respects, as you depart, um, your, your legacy and, and your role in developing and shaping and uh, lifting up the CFTC and its success, um, most notably since the financial crisis and Dodd-Frank, um, will remain for, for decades. Um, so we thank you for your integrity, for your fight, um, for helping draft laws that have become a part of the CEA for defending laws as general counsel and for shaping policy as a, a commissioner for the past three years. You, you pushed everyone at the agency, uh, but most notably, I think um, Dawn and I can say that you've made each um, of us better and forced us to think harder um, and forced us to think about things that we probably typically don't. And I'm pretty sure that everyone on the EMAC can say the same. So um, looking forward to today's meeting, looking forward to con the continued success of EMAC and uh, in many respects, it's your, your last meeting today, but you're also kicking off a, a very important project in examining carbon markets and the role the CFDC is going to play. So we'll be sure to make sure we shepherd that forward and, and see that its success is, is, is gone through over the next couple of months as this issue is critically important uh, to the success of our markets, but also to the safety of, of the globe as we're seeing so many different changes with climate change. So. Thank you again for all of your service. Um, looking forward to the meeting today. Um, and again, thanks to the EMAC members for their participation. Thanks, Abigail. 
Thank you, Acting Chairman Bannon. I now recognize Commissioner Stumpf to give her opening remarks. Thank, thank you, Madam Gale. Um, I too am looking forward to today's committee discussion. Um, I think we all recognize that as investor demand and private sector responses lead to uh, more voluntary carbon reducing efforts outside of the CSEC's purview, our market, as Commissioner Bergevitz already pointed out, must assist those industries that provide these essential resources, such as food and energy providers as they manage these new transitional risks. And so I do very much look forward to the meeting. I think all of those who were involved in putting it together, this is something the agency must, um, it, it's our job to do our part in helping to smooth this transition. If in fact that's where investors and the private sector take this, they're going to need our help in achieving the, um, the outcome that they're seeking. Um, a special thanks to, um, the sponsor of this committee, Commissioner Berkman. Um, and, and just a brief word about his impending departure from the agency. When Commissioner Berkman announced last week at a division director meeting that he um, was planning to leave, I became a bit emotional at the idea of him leaving the agency. I, in fact, never worked at this agency without Commissioner Berkman. And um, for all of the uh, reporters who called to ask me what I think the agency is going to look like um, going forward, I, I thought that perhaps humor was the best way for me to avoid the emotion today. So I have a few predictions for the reporters who may be listening in. For one, I predict that our open meetings will be much shorter. Maybe we can retire the stopwatch recently employed. And while I wouldn't want the Division of Enforcement to be disappointed, I expect the seven to eight hour closed meetings will also be a thing of the past. So I commit to Commissioner Burke that I will continue to have a lot of questions surrounding enforcement matters, just perhaps without the benefit of our banter. And I'm also guessing the general counsel may breathe a sigh of relief that he or she may no longer have to face one of their predecessors on a daily basis. And I expect the list of books and podcasts I download will dwindle once you're gone. And I may actually have to employ a therapist who will take my calls on Saturday when I have to vent about something that has bothered me process related. But I look forward to seeing what the new challenges that you will encounter bring. And I look forward to working with those who will carry on your legacy at the agency here at the CFTC. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Stump. Tina, I'm going to turn the meeting over to you now. Okay. Thank you, Abigail, and thank you. Commissioner Bergevitz, Mr. Chairman, and Commissioner Stump, I'm honored to be a member of the EMAC and to continue serving as a chair of the EMAC. I want to take a few minutes before we jump into today's discussion to also add my thanks to Commissioner Berkovitz. Uh, we really appreciate everything that you've done and serving as EMAC sponsor and also for your many years of service to the CFTC. We appreciate your leadership your willingness to devote time and attention to the issues being discussed here, and your thoughtful consideration of all points of view. I think I can speak for all of us on, the, on EMAC in saying thank you and, and wishing you well in the next chapter of your professional life. And hopefully sometime sooner rather than later, we can all gather in the same room and we can express our thanks to you personally, but I think for now we'll have to stick to the virtual thing. But we really appreciate your service and your leadership. As we've discussed before, this committee serves an important vehicle to discuss matters of concern to hedgers, consumers, exchanges, firms, and end users within our energy and environmental markets, as well as the Commission's regulation of these markets. Today's meeting serves as an opportunity to pick up on the EMAC discussion from June 3rd and to vote on a recommendation to the Commission to form an EMAC subcommittee that can delve deeper into this issue and provide get recommendations to the committee in the future report. As chair, I look forward to facilitating the discussion of the associate members' perspectives to the EMAC and working with the EMAC members to provide the Commission with feedback and recommendations that hopefully can assist the agency in its oversight of our market. To ensure that today's discussion is consistent with the EMAC Charter, which prohibits associate members from providing reports and recommendations directly to the Commission, 
We will first take questions and comments from the EMAC associate members after the panelists have shared their prepared remarks, and then we will then turn to EMAC members for their questions and comments on the prepared remarks and any feedback provided by the associate members. As Abigail mentioned, please use the chat function to alert her if you have a question or a comment, and we will we'll recognize you as a speaker after receiving your notification. Before we begin our panel today, we'd like to do a roll call of the members and associate members. We have your attendance on the record. Abigail, would you lead the roll call? Thank you, Dina. EMAC members, after I say your name and organization, please indicate that you are present. Please make sure your phone is not muted. If you're unable to hear your response, please send me a message via the WebEx chat to confirm that you are present on today's call so that I can correct the record. Shabu Bland, ICE Futures US. I'm here. Thank you, Trivia. Bob Kramer, FIA, PTG. Present. Thank you, Rob. Dimitri Caruso, Nodal Exchange, LLC. Hi, Hi, here. Good morning, Abigail. Thank you, Dimitri. Bill McCoy, Morgan Stanley. I'm present. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Lopa Parikh, Edison Electric Institute. I'm here, thank you. Thank you, Lopa. Zachy Roberts, Public Service Commission of West Virginia. I'm here, thank you. Excellent, thank you, Jackie. Derek Salmon, CME Group. Tyson Slocum, Public Citizen. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you, Tyson. And Tina Wiggins of Natural Gas Supply Association, Yes. I'm here. Thank you. EMAC associate members, after I say your name, please indicate that you are present. Matt Egan, American Gas Association. Good morning. I'm here. Thank you, Matt. Susan Bergels, Exelon Corporation. Good morning. Present. Thank you, Susan. Jessica Bowden, Millennium Management, LLC. Good morning. I'm present as well. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Paul Sicio, Industrial Energy Consumers of America. Daniel Dunleavy, Ingevity Corporation. I'm present. Good morning. David Ann. Kate Delp, DTCC Data Repository. Good morning. I'm present. Thank you, Kate. Eric Heinle, Office of the People's Council of the District of Columbia. Good morning, Abigail. Thank you, Eric. Paul Hughes, Southern Company. Good morning, Abigail. I'm here. Thank you, Paul. Jeff Hume, Continental Resources. Isaac Malik, Calpine Corporation. Dr. John Parsons, Special Government Employee. Good morning, I'm present. Thank you, Dr. Parsons. Delia Patterson, Ameri American Public Power Association. Good morning, Abigail. I'm here. Excellent. Thank you, Delia. Matt Bacardi, Commercial Energy Working Group. Hi, good morning, Abigail. I'm present. Thank you, Matt. Melinda Prudencio, the Energy Authority. Good morning, present. Thank you, Melinda. Dr. Richard Sandor, Environmental Financial Products, LLC. Dr. Sandor, we can't hear you, but I believe I've seen you on camera. Noha Sidham, Energy Trading Institute. Serge Malti, BP Energy Company. Good morning, I'm present. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Walker of ACES. Okay. Just again as a reminder, if again, I reminder, called your name and we did not hear your response, please email me or email contact me. me via the WebEx in the chat. Thank you. I will now turn the meeting back over to Dina. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you, Abigail. Our panel today will discuss further the proposal to form an EMAC subcommittee to support EMAC on the guiding principles for the design of the derivatives and underlying cash markets for environmental products such as carbon allowances and offsets that are used to address greenhouse gas emissions. 
We will hear prepared remarks from Tyson Slocum, a public citizen, Dr. John Parsons, a special government employee, and Matt Cardi on behalf of the Commercial Energy Working Group. Tyson, please go ahead. Dina, thank you so much. And uh, first, I just want to express my profound appreciation and thanks for uh, the great service of Commissioner Berkowitz. Uh, I first had the pleasure of working with uh, Commissioner Berkowitz when he was a Senate staffer, where he produced pioneering research on the role of excessive speculation in markets, and then as general counsel uh, to the CFCC and now as commissioner. Uh, as a public interest advocate, uh, Commissioner Berkowitz has really exemplified what a regulator uh, uh, should do in terms of prioritizing the public interest. And so I just want to say thank you so much uh, for your leadership over the years. Um, I, I, I really admire it. Um, uh, on the proposal to create the subcommittee, I am in support of forming a subcommittee to explore uh, uh, carbon markets. Uh, I do think that there are some considerations that the commission uh, and this advisory committee should have in putting together this subcommittee. And so first, I think it, it needs to be acknowledged that legislative and regulatory policy mandates have been the primary drivers of emissions reductions rather than market-based carbon trading schemes. Uh, emissions trading can, in limited and well-regulated circumstances, assist with cost-effective compliance of these regulatory programs. So it really uh, serves as a supplement to these regulated mandates, and this orientation could be a frame for the subcommittee's work. Second, it's really important that this subcommittee's membership feature robust representation of public interest stakeholders, including environmental justice perspectives. As you know, President Biden has announced a series of initiatives to prioritize environmental justice and energy justice in a number of the federal government's uh, programs and evaluations. And when it comes to market-based uh, emissions programs, this has been a thorny issue within the environmental justice community uh, for decades. And if the, the commission is going to formally explore this, we really need to ensure that we've got representation from the environmental justice community so that their perspectives are considered uh, in the uh, subcommittee's work. Um, third, the stakeholder interests of any uh, subcommittee member has to be transparent so the public has a clear understanding of who exactly is seeking to influence and inform uh, commission policy. Uh, for example, uh, the entity that proposed the subcommittee's creation, the Commercial Energy Working Group, it's not an actual company or trade association, but rather it's a lobbying vehicle operating out of a law firm that doesn't publicly release its membership. Uh, and, and adding to the confusion, some of the members that we do know of, such as the trader VTOL, operate more as a financial speculator than as a commercial interest. And so to avoid this kind of confusion, I think it's important that subcommittee members be as transparent as possible when it comes to uh, their um, membership interests. Fourth, I think the subcommittee needs to scrutinize the problematic role of offsets in emission reduction compliance and seek to strengthen verification standards of offsets. Uh, given the challenges that offsets have in delivering real emission reductions, the subcommittee could instead encourage mechanisms that produce direct emission avoidance from point and mobile sources. And finally, the subcommittee should assess whether carbon markets intrinsic volatility limits the efficiency of emission reduction goals. Uh, a mission of the subcommittee should be to explore whether carbon markets should be considered a benefit or a barrier to effective emission mitigation. I really appreciate the opportunity to give these remarks. Thank you so much. Dr. Parson? Thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm happy to be uh, here and provide three suggestions for this uh, subcommittee. But before I do, I'd just like to briefly add my appreciation uh, for Commissioner Berkowitz. It's been a pleasure to get to know you through this EMAC, and I really appreciate all the service you've provided. So thank you very much for that opportunity to um, connect, and I uh, wish you well. So the three comments, I'll label my first one is the cart and the horse. Um, a carbon market can be an important component of a larger government mandate to reduce emissions. Market can often find cheaper ways to accomplish the goal, marshalling an enormous set of businesses, engineers, and others to pitch in and find better means to the end. But my worry is that some people focus almost exclusively on the market and the trading and overlook the gov larger government mandate. They put the cart before the horse. This committee has a very clear example of this mistaken focus. Back in 2019 at our November 7th meeting, we heard a panel presenting information on environmental derivative contracts, and we were presented with this slide, if I can ask that the slides be uh, shown. So this slide shows the dramatic, this was from one of the presentations that we received, uh, one of the panels that were presented. It shows the dramatic decline of sulfate deposition across North America between the three-year period of 1989 and 1991, shown on the left, and the later three-year period of 2014 to 2016, shown on the right. The slide closes with the takeaway market-based solution for U.S. acid rain, presumably referring to the SO2 allowance trading program instituted by the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. And this was presented to us as a representation of existing environmental markets. But I have to point out that at the time this was presented, and even before the chart on the right, the years relevant there, 2014 to 2016, the bad news is the SO2 allowance trading program is long dead. There is no real trading. The price is approximately zero. The market is dead. It was killed by a series of political decisions, regulatory actions, and court rulings beginning in the 2000s. Can I have the next slide? So this slide is a figure that's excerpted from an article in the Economics Journal, the Journal of uh, Economic Perspectives, authored by two of the leading researchers on uh, emission markets, and one of whom participated in the was on the Council of Economic Advisors when the SO2 market was created. And it charts the events leading up to the death. The last date on there is in 2012, um, leading up to the death of that market. Um, and, you know, that's the reality that we had, not what was shown on, what was described in that first slide. The, the slide, uh, the first slide creates the false impression that the market is the reason for the drop in sulfate deposition. It was not. Although the market was dead, the Clean Air Act was not. The SO2 trading program was always a component of the larger emissions control legislation. It was never the market on its own. Indeed, the market was a tool to enable less expensive paths for achieving the overall mandate. The market was not a substitute for the mandate. And when the market died in 2012, the larger set of policies and frameworks did not die. Although the SO2 trading was no longer useful, polluters still had to comply with the mandates for emission reductions, and these mandates had grown tighter. It's the larger framework that should be credited with making the second map green. So if this committee is going to create a subcommittee to produce a report on carbon markets, it is my hope that the subcommittee will focus not only on the market, disembodied from the larger framework that produces the emission reductions needed. It should address the governmental authority and the supervisory capacity needed both to enable the market and to generally assure reductions no matter how the market functions. It should also include relevant scientific expertise 
essential to guiding real emission reductions. Point number two is about privately organized offset markets. They are precarious. So voluntary offset markets are a familiar tool for carbon emission reductions, with both good and bad lessons to be learned from efforts in the past. Within a larger state-mandated and supervised system, offsets may perhaps play a useful role. Offsets by their nature are inherently voluntary, even when they're enabled through a state-mandated and supervised system. For example, California's cap-and-trade program has offsets. But recently, the talk in the financial community and in some parts of industry has been for voluntary offsets created outside of any state-mandated and supervised system, organized exclusively by private actors. That is a horse of an entirely different color. Outside of a state-mandated emission regime, offsets cannot provide a foundation for a market that is well-grounded to fundamentals and providing reliable price discovery and sound risk management. One main danger is that the private sector actors responsible for the market have interests that are not coincident with the long-run purpose of reducing emissions. The words, word manipulation is a touchstone here. The CFTC has already once confronted the problem of private actors manipulating the market in the credit default swaps market. Getting a hold of this problem will be an order of magnitude more difficult in a purely offset, purely voluntary offset market, a private voluntary offset market for carbon. A second danger is the possibility of a disruptive asset bubble. The state has many capacities that are essential to providing the needed social license as well as the economic reliability offset developers themselves need Without state involvement, for-profit actors are incentivized to exploit hype and fashion instead of realism. In the long run, that undermines the success of the offset market, and worse, undermines the goal of reducing emissions and protecting the planet's health. I recommend that the subcommittee carefully distinguish between privately organized voluntary offset markets and those operated within state-mandated and supervised emission reductions programs. It should consider carefully the dangers of manipulation and whether the voluntary market uh, outside of state supervision can assure uh, the price is reliable and reflective of fundamentals. It should ask whether the CFTC's statutory responsibilities can be faithfully executed with respect to such privately organized markets. It should address the potential benefits that voluntary offset markets could uh, the benefits they could gain from being organized within state-mandated and supervised programs. And third and last point is uh, don't be myopic. Think beyond smokestack and tailpipe CO2 emissions. The greenhouse gas problem is fundamentally different from other emission problems. It encompasses vast swaths of industry and agriculture. Creating a low-carbon economy involves not just reducing CO2 and other GHG emissions. It also involves finding substitutes for the various energy and agricultural and land use practices uh, that we currently rely on. Uh, industry and agricultural practices have to be reshaped in many ways. New commodities will become important parts of the low-carbon economy. In the circles currently struggling to make these changes, hydrogen is currently up the fashion. There's lots of talk about renewable natural gas, synthetic natural gas. We don't just need a market for carbon, we need markets for some of these new commodities. My own crystal ball is broken and currently in the shop, so I won't try to make any firm predictions about which of these commodities will actually turn out to be important and which not. But we need to be thinking about it. We, we need industry to be working with government uh, on these new markets. If the CFTC is going to have a subcommittee, let its mandate extend beyond trading carbon. Let's think about a positive future. How do we get to this low carbon economy? The problems are large. The CFTC has great expertise 
and could be a useful convener and engager on this. For example, the administ this current administration has made assuring competitive markets a priority. A competitive market for the underlying commodity is a prerequisite for a derivative market in the commodity. How can we assure vibrant competition in these new commodity markets? For another example, land use is an important source of greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing emissions in land use is a really tough nut to crack. What's going to be the place of markets in regulating land use emissions? I don't know, but we need to find people who are thinking about this and start working on the problem. Key to cracking this nut is science, both about the carbon cycle and about agricultural practices. This is another example of why it's essential that the subcommittee include members able to provide necessary scientific expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Matt, over to you.
trading and related carbon derivative markets. Transcript of the June 3rd meeting also includes a report on the efforts to promote voluntary carbon markets and the carbon emission credits and the offsets to support net zero emission goals. Task Force on Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets has examined and published its findings with respect to how to scale these markets. A critical component in scaling these markets is market design. Some, as the primary compliance markets for carbon emissions grow, secondary and derivative markets will follow as this dynamic unfolds. Not only will the Commission need to ensure that carbon derivative markets are properly regulated and monitored, but the Commission's resources and expertise may be helpful to primary market regulators, many of them. Working Group's statement of purpose poses certain guiding principles for an EMAC uh, and refined in part uh, as part of preparation of a report intended to address carbon market designs that will attract liquidity in part through the use of carbon derivatives and protect the integrity of such markets. Secondary markets for emission allowances and offsets in derivative markets will be critical in helping the CEC execute certain of its first statutory missions, early and orderly trading in commodity derivative markets and protecting the sale of commodities in interstate fraud and manipulation. I would be happy to review the principles that were included in the working group's proposal if necessary, which focus on ensuring market integrity, attracting liquidity, promoting price discovery, as well as addressing cross-border coordination, which will become more important as other sovereign jurisdictions develop and implement cap-and-trade cell carbon emission programs. I would like to add just a few brief comments on what, what was presented already. Um, I think many of the proposals that were um, uh, mentioned helpful, and, and one thing we just need to be concerned about is not getting too far in the mission creep because the role of our permission Sorry? Uh, if you could just speak a little bit louder, we're having some uh, trouble hearing you. I, I apologize. Um, I'm a little bit far from the phone. No, I, I just wanted to uh, voice my support for some of the suggestions of the previous about the role of uh, uh, the subcommittee and the things it should examine, and I just want to make sure that the issues that we talk about uh, remain somewhat focused on our primary mission, with, which is looking at the markets, because one of the core principles we had when we set up this proposal mm -hmm. was to avoid kind of mission creep in terms of telling other uh, regulators what they should, should be doing. But with that said, I do think some very good comments were provided by the previous speakers for many of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank our presenters this morning, Tyson and John and Matt. Thank you very much for your comments. And at this time, I would like to open the floor to questions and comments from the associate members on these remarks. Abigail, is anyone asked to speak? I've not seen anything in the not chat. If anyone has a question, has please, let question. Let please let me know. Please let me know. I believe we have a question that Paul Hughes would like to Paul, please hey, go uh, ahead. Thanks. Sorry, I'm a little thanks, slow sorry, on the mute button. Slow on the mute. I would just like to confirm and clarify that we have a very specific, I guess uh, my question is, our very specific our very outcome specific that we're desiring that from, we're the committee, desiring from the committee, the subcommittee. And so I, I know that the I Commercial that Energy, Working Energy Working Group working has, has framed this up as coming up with a list of fundamentals. Of fundamentals. Oh, one moment. I Can we have everyone use their lines? We're getting uh, an echo. Getting uh, an echo. Hey, okay, Paul, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Oh, that's much better. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that, that we all really have, I'm a little concerned, I think um, Matt may have used the, the phrase scope creep. I, I guess I just want to make sure we have um, – a very, very clear picture of what um, the EMAC would expect at the end of this. Is it a list of primary fundamentals 
uh, a framework that should exist for any development of a larger um, carbon market, or is it a list of suggestions that should be considered if there is a growing uh, carbon market? I, I've, there's lots of things that we've, we've kind of thrown out there, so I guess I would really appreciate, and maybe this is just me because I'm a little slow, uh, that we really pinpoint what the desired outcome is. What do we expect to be a final report or a final deliverable? Because I feel like right now it still feels like a little bit broad. So that that's kind of my question slash statement, just to make sure before we go down this road, we, we really know what we want the de- deliverable to kind of look like and include. And, and I'll just leave it at that. Sure, if you wanted uh, me to make a comment on that, that's appropriate. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think that that you know a lot of this discussion can happen at the subcommittee level. I think that the idea of assessing what the primary markets look like uh, was within the scope of what we were thinking because the idea was to make sure we understood how they function because they relate to the secondary markets and the derivatives that ultimately is jurisdiction over. My concern would be if we use this, I don't think it was intended to discussion of, of the, the necessarily um, the best ways to achieve climate policy goals because I don't think that's necessarily uh, what, what we were, is the focus of this particular project and our other regulators and, and the folks express that in a, in, a, in a larger way. But that was our thinking. We do think, though, that some discussion of what those markets look like are, is important, the primary markets, because they do affect uh, the direct- So, Matt, let me maybe ask again. I'm a, I hope I'm not stepping out of line here. So is the thought that the, the, the deliverable would be a report on kind of a general assessment of from this this EMAC of, of things to consider, or is it they would the the subcommittee would come forth with a recommendation? I'm I'm just trying to I, I'm with you. I, I'm not opposing. I'm just making sure. I just want to understand what we think would be the the result. I I, I could foresee things to consider in, for example, what we think good primary market designs would look like that would make for markets that derivative markets that the commission by liquidity and price discovery and the things that we like. In terms of recommendation, it would more focus on what the derivatives of markets and uh, market design and the um, secondary markets should should look like. So we're, we're, the report would maintain, contain recommendations about the markets that we see the CFD having jurisdiction over and more reviewing what's going on in the primary markets. And that, that was at least what was intended in Thank you. I believe Paul Sissio has indicated that he would like to speak. Paul? Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, Paul Sissio with Industrial Energy Consumers of America. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, this, uh, we're, we are concerned about, um, about the initiative um, because it means essentially so much to uh, energy-intensive trade-exposed industries. Uh, if you know anything about um, these industries, they are energy-intensive. They are they use lots of natural gas and electricity. Competitiveness is determined by the consumption of energy, and we compete on a global basis. Now. Um, in regards to, uh, I need to give a little bit of a preface uh, so that my remarks are in the proper context. Uh, 
the manu- for those who do not know, since 1990, manufacturing in the U.S. has reduced CO2 emissions by 23%. That is more than any other sector of the U.S. economy. In fact, uh, we are using, EIA data says that we are using about the same amount of energy on a BTU basis now that we did 50 years ago. And we, are, we have increased our manufacturing gross output by 112%. And you think about that, we've increased output by 112% using the same amount of BTUs. That is a tremendous success story. But that success story is underpinned by a very fundamental element, is that these industries compete globally. They have tough, subsidized global competition from countries all over the world. And because energy is a cost, then we we are self-motivated to reduce our energy costs, and therefore we have uh, succeeded in what we did. But we are very limited by our ability to decarbonize. Uh, And so uh, one of the questions I have in uh, in CFTC and the subcommittee taking this on is, is the uh, is is a is how big the scope of this is, and uh, when I say we do not have the technology to decarbonize, I'm going to read something that was uh, written by you know, by Chairman Frank Pallone from the House Energy and Commerce Committee in January of 2020, and he says that um, the uh, manufa- industrial sector. Uh, is the most challenging sector to decarbonize, one of the most technically and economically challenging sectors to decarbonize. In some cases, greenhouse gas emissions are unavoidable byproducts of industrial processes. In others, low-carbon alternatives are either prohibitively expensive or underdeveloped. Several industrial subsectors also compete in highly competitive markets, and manufacturers may choose to relocate production overseas rather than invest in emissions mitigation technologies. These energy-intensive and trade-exposed industries subsequently face steep barriers to deep carbonization. The committee believes that industrial decarbonization will require both industry and process-specific solutions, as well as cross-cutting measures. It is imperative that the Congress and the executive branch put in place policy measures across all committee and agency jurisdictions to preserve the global competitiveness of energy-intensive trade-exposed industries and manufacturing in the United States, unquote. Chairman Pallone has got it right. And so uh, when you talk about uh, carbon policies, it gets, if we do not have the technology to decarbonize, and we have carbon pricing, carbon pricing just becomes a cost. And you can talk about uh, the uh, benefits of, uh, of uh, hedging and so forth, but um, to establish carbon and cap and trade, you got to have a border adjustment. Border adjustments raises all kinds of trade issues. And imported product, to make this work, would you would have to determine the embodied energy, carbon, in each of the products that are imported. Just think about how complex that is. Those imported products would need to be third-party validated as to their carbon embodied energy. You would need governments to enforce the determination of the, that embodied energy. Our experience in the real world, the competitive world that we exist in dealing with countries like China, but also many other countries that cheat, they subsidize their energy in lots of different ways that's really creative. And I question the ability 
uh, uh, of, of border adjustments to work effectively uh, given um, these challenges. We are a long, long way from having global governments join hands uh, with uh, this cross-border type uh, acknowledgement and verification. So what I'm saying is, you know, we, we're doing, our manufacturing sector, we represent a large part of the economy, $2.2 trillion of the economy. And my point is we can't mess that up. Uh, we want to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but it's got to be done cost effectively. Arbitrary carbon costs, okay, um, we got to be very sensitive to this international competition as we go forward. So I'm, I, I, uh, I'm, I, I am concerned, I'm questioning whether this is going to be a, a good thing. I'm open. To, uh, to suggestions, but I'm here. I am. I'm, I'm concerned about moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Is there anyone else of the associate members, Abigail, who's indicated a, a desire to speak? I've not seen anything in the chat. But if there's any other associate members, please feel free to go forward. Hearing none, well, thank you to the EMAC associate members. And at this time, I would like to open the floor to questions and comments from the EMAC members on the prepared remarks. Are there any of the EMAC members who wish to speak? Yes, we have a comment from Jackie Roberts. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Hello. I'm trying to. Adjust here. Adjust here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Taking up this topic. Up this topic. Interesting topic. Interesting topic. I want to say. I want to say. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. Berkowitz, for your service. Your service. Leadership. Leadership. Um, um, you um, have always made uh, state regulators. And I don't know if I'm the first as an advocate for a state regulator. You've always made us you always made us welcome. Even though this is a very deep subject, uh, your address, uh, your address. Um, I do have some comments. First of all, I let me let me let me interrupt here for just two seconds. We're getting an echo. If you're not speaking, could you please make sure that your microphone is muted? Thank you. Is that better? Is that better? Okay, so we're good. So I, I let me reiterate, thank you, Commissioner Berkowitz. Thank you for including the state perspective as a consumer advocate and the state commission is what I am now representing uh, in these conversations. Um, we, the West Virginia Commission, agrees with Ty Slocum regarding inclusion of diverse um, perspectives on this subcommittee, and I think that including uh, input from the state regulators who have such an important role in formulating the policy of greenhouse gas emissions uh, is, is a wise thing to do. I also agree with... Um, John Parsons, and recommend you think beyond the charge of, of the proposed charge of this subcommittee. Uh, and I think we would, the West Virginia Commission would recommend that uh, you revisit the jurisdictional issues between the CFTC and the FERC. The West Virginia Commission believes that it's appropriate for energy and where applicable capacity markets and the related markets um, exist in RTOs and ISOs, that that is an appropriate uh, area for FERC jurisdiction. We believe that the financial markets, um, environmental markets, uh, FTRs, uh, ARRs should be um, under the jurisdiction of the CFTC. 
the CFTC is the expert in financial markets. Um, FERC, as, as, as good a job as it does, is not an expert in that area. And we have seen recently the problems in those areas, first with ARRs, FTRs, and PJM, and the debacle of Green Hat, which was completely avoidable and I don't think ever would have happened under CFTC jurisdiction. And the, uh, the effort uh, by RTOs to try to decide um, whether, you know, state actions in, in regulating greenhouse gases should be, considerations of that should be included in their energy and capacity markets. So, that's the recommendation of the West Virginia Commission, and uh, we really appreciate you uh, considering our comments. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other EMAC members who would like to speak? I think we have one. This Derek? is uh, Richard Sandor. Can mm -hmm. you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. <laughs> Good. Uh, First of all, a, a major congratulations to and thank you to Dan Berkovitz, uh, who unambiguously brings a sense of clarity and scholarship to the commission. And Dan, I'll miss you sorely <laughs> and look forward to working with you in the future. Um, one quick comment just on the SO2 map, and the map is correct in, in one sense, but I think it's important to understand that the levels of reductions um, in the later years were not caused by the active trading of SO2 allowances, but that green area was caused by the trading that existed early on. So, for example, we financed the scrubber in 1993, and it reduced emissions, and those show up later in a green area. So many of the things that exist later were spurred on at the outset, whether it was modification of boilers for Powder River coal, wind turbines, scrubbers, etc. So the map is correct technically, but we shouldn't forget that the pricing of SO2 allowances motivated scrubbers that were installed in the 90s but were useful in keeping SO2 out of the air. So I just wanted to make that technical comment. And the other one is a student of the CFTC, and I'm 700 years old, as you guys know, so having been involved in the creation of the act and Many of the things in 1974 and 75 everybody said would be too technical or complex. This agency, through intelligent regulation, enabled. So in 74, nobody could ever trade treasury bond futures. That was too complicated. Uh, it would never work. Nobody could ever trade crude oil. That was too complicated. It would never work. Nobody could trade stock index futures. Too complicated. It would never work. Nobody could trade SO2. Too complicated. It would never work. Nobody could trade carbon. Too complicated. It would never work. Um, nobody could trade cryptocurrencies. Too complicated. It would never work. This agency's ability, working with independent advisory committees over the last, since its existence in 75, over the last 45 years, has shown its ability to effectively regulate and provide oversight to, a vet, to what is now the entire industry 
um, between financials, energy, and the environment, none of which existed. So please, all, <laughs> all of the fellow members, be confident in this regulatory agency's ability to adapt and creatively and prudentially regulate new markets uh, which, not, which might not exist. Uh, thank you, Abigail. I think earlier I saw in the chat that Derek Salmon had a comment. Derek? Sorry, yeah, Dino, thank you. Well, right, if I'm we could sorry, just go I'm back, uh, Jaya Patterson, who is an associate member, has a comment, and then we'll turn back to the members. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Jillian Patterson, please. Sure. Um, I, I just wanted to um, also, you know, wish Commissioner Berkovitz the best in the future, and I too appreciated, um, you know, his service to the commission. And um, when he was general counsel, he um, you know, did a fantastic job. I, I also remember him, you know, coming and speaking to my members um, when C. Kelly was, uh, you know, general counsel of APCA, and um, definitely, you know, wish you the best. Um, in the future, thank you for your your uh, service. Um, you know, tirelessly uh, your public service. So really appreciate that. Um, as I was listening to Paul Sissio's comments, I um, you know I, I I really think that um, they they do uh, bear listening to, and I, I really would, would like uh, to know if you know thoughts like that were considered in terms of, you know, an unintended consequences that may result uh, from us undertaking um, this effort. And so um, if there is, you know, uh, if there had been any, you know, contemplation of those unintended consequences, I would, um, would love to hear if that was considered and um, there were, uh, there are, you know, things that are in place to avoid, you know, the concerns that Paul raised then. Um, you know, perhaps, you know, there's nothing to be concerned about. And so um, maybe that would put my concerns to rest. And so I, I just put that question out there. I think we have a couple of other comments from the associate members. Sarah Tomalty. Yeah, Please thank you, Dina. Um, I also want to pile on and wish Commissioner Berkovitz uh, well in his future endeavors. Um, we've, we've appreciated your leadership, and you will be sorely missed in this community. Um, I'm interested in discussing the scope of this effort. Uh, Dr. Parsons mentioned state-mandated emissions regimes and discussed the difference in the current level of supervision between voluntary markets and state-mandated emissions regimes. And I'm hearing a lot of com complexity around the need to involve states in this discussion, given their current oversight of state-mandated programs. Um, given the lower level of supervision that currently exists around um, voluntary markets, should the scope of this effort initially prioritize setting guiding principles for voluntary markets? No one wants to respond to that directly. We will go back to the um, the EMAC members who had requested a comment, and that would be Derek Salmon and then Bill McCoy. You know, All right, we have a, a yes. comment now from Dan Dunleavy, associate member. Okay. Oh, okay. Dan, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I just wanted to comment quickly, um, again, thanking Commissioner Berkovitz and, and noting that, um, you know, he kind of opened up um, the scope of the type of memberships um, to the likes of Ingevity, who is an industrial uh, manufacturing end user. So I just uh, thank him for that and for his foresight. And as we talk about, you know, this um, this effort underway with carbon markets generally that, um his vision to, you know, be inclusive and to hear the voice um, 
of the industrial, the manufacturing end user, just to be considered um, in the discussion going forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. I think, Abigail, now we will turn back to the EMAC members. Right? Derek, did you have a comment? I did. Just to, to at, at the risk of piling on like so many others, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Commissioner Berkovitz for the incredible work, leadership, dedication, and drive to make our derivatives markets the best regulated derivatives markets in the world. I want to extend uh, our thanks on behalf of CME Group to Commissioner Berkovitz for all he has done. Um, I have a feeling we'll be working together and seeing Dan uh, continue to be uh, very active in this market, so we look forward to uh, working with you again, Dan, in the future. But congratulations. Thank you for your leadership, particularly to EMAC as well. It's been an honor to serve um, on this committee, and we look forward to this work continuing and all the work that you've done to set this committee up for success going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Derek. Bill McCoy, did you have a comment? Uh, yes. Uh, and again, as I may echo that of uh, others, I'd like to also uh, thank Commissioner Berkovich for his many years of service and his sponsorship of the EMAC. Uh, I've known you from uh, the days that you served as general counsel and the uh, impact you've had on the commission over these uh, many years. And I'm sure in some future capacity, we will see you have a good impact in terms of both uh, the commission and the markets and the industry as well. As well. So look forward to uh, hearing what your future endeavors may be. Um, I just had just a few comments. Uh, I think we've heard a lot of interesting uh, perspectives and points regarding uh, and, and concerns uh, regarding what the ultimate uh, product of a, a subcommittee report can be. And you know, it would be difficult in a few minutes to you know, pick on a, a number of them. But uh, as I mentioned during the June meeting, uh, I think there's a great benefit to the concept of uh, being focused on how these markets are, as they've been developing, both the, the mandatory markets, the compliance markets, and the voluntary uh, offset markets. I do think that the scope uh, should be looking at both because there there is a, a type of linkage where, depending on the types of market participants, as to whether or not uh, they are going to have access to one or the other. So I don't. I do not think we should just focus on one versus the other. And uh, but these markets are, by nature, by definition, somewhat disjointed within the U.S. Obviously, with different uh, the different uh, compliance markets and just globally as well. So as I had mentioned in June, the you know, trying to consider guiding principles that not only the Commission but other policymakers could observe to help reduce the various uh, barriers that may exist to globalization and harmonization are important. So that's why I would uh, I'd be endorsing uh, the formation. And I'm sure that the subcommittee can understand the scope so that you know, while it may want to point to other issues, uh, it should be focused on the secondary markets and the derivative markets, at least in an initial report, in order to be able to accomplish uh, uh, such a mission. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. I think Tyson would like to make a comment, and then also Lopa. Tyson, would you go ahead, please? Yeah, Dina, thank you so much. Uh, so first, I've got a quick clarifying question and then a comment. Uh, so on the question, there's been a number of good comments here by folks uh, asking questions about the scope of the subcommittee's charge. And so my question is, are these details that we need to resolve now? Uh, when we vote to create the subcommittee, do we have to have sort of a concrete idea about what that subcommittee charge is, or is that something that the subcommittee works on, or is it a combination thereof? And second, uh, I just wanted to quickly respond to Jackie Roberts. Uh, she made a number of comments, uh, and, and one comment she made was on uh, the, the state of West Virginia supporting an effort for the CFTC to be the lead entity with jurisdiction over um, uh, financial transmission rights in uh, FERC jurisdictional markets. I know that's a little different from the, the carbon pricing issue, but uh, I just want to applaud uh, West Virginia regulators for taking this position. As the CFTC knows, 
we formally petitioned the CFTC three years ago uh, asking the uh, CFTC to revoke the exemptions it granted to these regional transmission organizations because we documented clear and compelling evidence that they were in violation of the terms of that exemption. And the CFTC has not yet responded formally to our petition. I'll, I'll drop it in the chat, but uh, I just wanted to um, thank uh, Jackie Roberts and, and West Virginia regulators for uh, their leadership on this issue. I just have a quick question about the scope of the report, just to provide some clarity. So, what, assuming the EMAC votes to recommend that the Commission approve the formation of the subcommittee, a Federal Register notice will go out. It will have some bullet points, which will be pulled basically from the discussion today, as well as maybe some um, of the comments made at the June 3rd meeting. But it is up to the subcommittee when it meets, when it is finally formed and meets, to discuss, to um, determine the exact scope of what the content will be in the report. So nothing is being decided firmly at, at, during this discussion at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. Lofa? Thank you all. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Berkowitz. I'm obviously going to pile on. Uh, it was, um, it's been wonderful working with you during your entire tenure um, and all your capacities at the commission. So um, hopefully we'll be continuing to work together in the future. Um, a lot of, uh, I just kind of want to reiterate or not, uh, and a little bit about what um, has already been said. Um, as Bill indicated, I don't think that we, you know, kind of oppose having this subcommittee focus on secondary and derivative markets. Um, I would, you know, note as others have indicated that there is a lot of activity currently around this space. Um, EPA, FERC, and Congress are all kind of dabbling in this area, um, and there's a lot of activity happening in a lot of different positions, as we noted before, about the impact that it might have on um, various stakeholders. So I would just, uh, you know, while I think this effort is um, probably a good one going forward, I would just encourage um, the commission to just be aware of everything else that is happening in this space and to make sure that the scope is appropriately confined to um, the jurisdiction of the commission so that we can um, continue to maintain regulatory certainty and all the other aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Lopa. Are there any other EMAC members who have a comment or a question? Abigail, I'm not seeing any on the chat. Are you? No, I'm not. Thank you. Thank you. How about the commissioners? Does any of the any commissioners wish to speak? I, 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 I have a few comments. If this is the correct time, Abigail or Dina. I, I just wanted to first of all, I wanted to thank all of the commenters. Been a really interesting discussion, and I especially want to thank Dr. Sander for his vote of confidence. Um, yes, uh, the CFTC is quite capable of regulating the varied and complex derivatives markets you oversee, uh, you know, ranging from physical commodities to market financial commodities, and even uh, digital assets related commodities. And so, we're fortunate to have the benefit of the assistance of these advisory committees. And we rely upon you all so, so much. Today, there, there seems to be some debate within the committee about the scope of any subcommittee. And while that is certainly not a question for me to answer, this is your committee, and, and I want you to devise any subcommittees as you see fit, I can tell you what is helpful to me in doing my job with the benefit of your input. And what is most helpful to me are recommendations to the commission about environmental markets regulated by the commission. And those are the derivatives markets. Uh, any, these debates surrounding bigger picture issues, such as a preference for privately organized offset markets versus mandated offsets, or even efforts to reshape the underlying physical commodity markets is, is simply well beyond the CFTC's authority. So our role is to ensure that if and when these events occur, the requisite derivatives markets are able to properly support the, and perform their functions 
Um, and I only point this out, not, not to be critical of anything that's been said, but I rely upon the information we receive from the advisory committee heavily, and, and I think what was helpful to me is recommendations related to properly functioning derivatives market. And, and not to promote my own propaganda, but I, I put out a piece in late August. It was specific to digital assets, but I think it may apply here. Um, we continue to see new and emerging markets, and some of the market participants are, I think, seemingly confused about what the CFTC's authority is. So I, I will pull it up right now, but I think it's really important that the marketplace understand the CFTC's specific authority and why we do care about the underlying market and what we regulate, which is the derivatives market. So, um, to the extent you want to read it, it's um, dated August 23rd. It's on the CCC's website. And I think it's applicable here just as it was to digital assets. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Does any other commissioner wish to speak or have a comment? Abigail, I am not hearing that any other commissioner wishes to speak. I don't, I don't have any other comments. Okay. Well, I think it is time for us to move to the matter at hand here. So with that in mind, I would like to move that the EMAC recommend to the commission that it consider creating a subcommittee to provide a report to the EMAC on carbon market design. Is there a second? I would like to second it. This is Bill McCoy of Morgan Stanley. Thank you, Bill. Are there any further questions or comments? Abigail, do we have anything in chat? I'm not seeing anything. So not seeing any additional questions or comments, we will now take a vote on the motion that the EMAC recommends to the commission that it consider creating a subcommittee to provide a report to the EMAC on carbon market design. As a matter of the point of order here, a simple majority of vote of the nine present EMAC members is necessary. So I will turn this over to Abigail for the vote. Thank you, Dina. EMAC members, when I call your name, please indicate your agreement with A, disagreement with nay, or indicate your abstention from the vote. Please remember to unmute your audio on WebEx and your phone to indicate your vote, and then mute your audio once you are done voting. Shrubu Bland, Ice Futures US. I vote yes. Shikru's land goes yes. Rob Kramer, FIA PTG. I vote yes as well. Thank you. Rob Kramer votes yes. Dimitri Caruso, Snowdle Exchange LLC. Aye. Dimitri Caruso votes aye. Bill McCoy, Morgan Stanley. Aye. I vote yes. Bill McCoy votes aye. Lopez Freak, Edison Electric Institute. Um, I'm going to abstain. Local Creek, abstain. Jackie Roberts, Public Service Commission of West Virginia. Aye. Jackie Roberts votes aye. Derek Salmon, CME Group. I vote aye. Derek Salmon votes aye. Tyson Slocum, Public Citizen. I vote aye. Tyson Slocum votes aye and Dina Wiggins, Natural Gas Supply Association. I vote aye. Dina Wiggins votes aye. Madam Chair, you have eight vote, yes votes and one abstention. Thank you, Abigail. The ayes have it and the motion carries. The recommendation to form an EMAC subcommittee to provide a report to the EMAC on carbon market design has been adopted and will be submitted to the commission for its consideration. I think this concludes the work of the EMAC today. Thank you to all of the members and associate members for your thoughtful participation today. We look forward to the ongoing work of the EMAC and our next meeting on a date to be determined for next year. I will turn it over to Abigail for closing remarks. Thank you, Dina. I now recognize Acting Chair Benham for his closing remarks.
we may be having some slight difficulties, we will turn back to Acting Chairman Benham. Uh, I now recognize Commissioner Stump to give her closing remarks. Thank, thank you, Abigail, and thanks to Dina for managing today's meeting. Um, and I know Commissioner Berkman has already mentioned the host of people that make these things happen. It is really amazing how we've been able to adapt. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to everyone who participated. I thought the conversation was extremely interesting, and I do look forward to um, seeing the, the membership of the subcommittee and, and the um, potential for um, a subsequent report. I, I think this is important work. It is um, even, I think we're always challenged by the new and exciting things we get to consider, and this is no different. Um, we've, in just the last year, we've had um, really interesting discussions about new and novel things. This is not novel, it's just a matter of how we develop this market, how the market develops in a way that can support the derivatives market. And I think that's always at the front of, the front of mind for the commission, but we're enabling people or providing um, opportunities for the listing of derivatives products. We have certain principles that we need to um, meet and, and we expect those who provide these products to meet. And very important to those considerations is how the underlying develop the underlying market develops and can support a derivative market. So I think everything that's been said today is extremely interesting and I look forward to ongoing conversations with the subcommittee and the committee as this uh, continues to develop. Thank you. And thank you to Commissioner Berkovitz. Um, for, for everything. Uh, the committee will miss you, the commission will miss you, and I will personally miss you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Stump. We're now going to turn back to Acting Chairman Benham for his closing remarks. Thanks, Abigail. Um, and I apologize for that uh, missed opportunity, but I'm on the train heading to New York, so we'll only do audio. But um, having listened to the meeting, this is great. I appreciate all the comments. Again, Commissioner Berkovitz, for your leadership on these issues, um, Abigail and Dina. And, you know, this is, as, as the President's noted, uh, all a government approach, I think, is the right way to think about climate, climate change, and what we each can do as individuals and collectively as agencies to support the transition. Um, and, yeah, we are bound by certain statutory restrictions uh, and, and different elements of expertise, but I do believe uh, very firmly um, that at the CFTC we have a lot of expertise in risk management, in price discovery, in climate management, um, and our markets demonstrate that. Our registrants have demonstrated that, and we heard from some today. So we certainly will work together with our fellow agencies across the board, whether financial or otherwise, but I do think we have a huge, huge uh, role to play uh, in this effort, um, and, and I'm looking forward to it and looking forward to the role that EMAC can play in, in contributing to what the CFTC um, can do to support uh, the larger global effort. So thanks again to um, the folks who participated today and everyone who made it uh, uh, function so smoothly. And um, one last shout out to Dan and uh, for all of his leadership and his time at the CFTC. We're going to miss you, um, but obviously keep it in touch for many, many years. So thank, thank you, Commissioner Berkman. Thank you, Acting Chairman Benham. I now turn to Commissioner Berkovitz to give his closing remarks. Well, th th thank you, Abigail, and, and thank you, um, um, Russ, and, and, and thank you, Dawn, uh, for your kind remarks, and, and thanks to the members and associate members for, for their kind remarks, too. Um, I'm going to, uh, I, I didn't really have prepared closing remarks, I had a prepared opening statement, but um, a couple of the comments uh, uh, prompted me to. Uh, uh, add some additional comments here, here at the end, and, and in the limited time left while I've got a platform, uh, I'll use the privilege, <laughs> take advantage of the privilege uh, uh, of speaking. And, and uh, a, couple of the, um, a couple of the members and associate members um, mentioned uh, the diversity uh, on the EMAC and, and, and my interest in and support of the diversity, and, and um, that, that's true. I, I really believe that the, the strength of, of this committee and, and all our advisory committees really lies in its diversity, and it's a statutory requirement. Uh, but uh, it's it's really I, I think here at the commission, I, I know all of us at the commission 
um, and, and all the sponsors of the committees, various committees, and, and, and I, I share it, um, uh, support uh, and, and strive for that diversity. And it's really critical to the success uh, of these committees that we get the, uh, the, the expertise um, uh, as well as the, the, broad, the broad spectrum of views. So I think each of, each of your views is, is incredibly um, important. In, in a broader sense, um, th these advisory committees and, and, and the, the voluntary spirit, um, uh, you, you all are volunteering your, your time and your, 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 um, uh, the entities that you work for uh, uh, allow you to do this and, and uh, and so they support it as well, and I'm very appreciative of that. But at the risk of overdoing it and overhyping what I'm about to say, um, I, I really think fundamentally that what we're doing here really embodies the, the spirit, uh, you know, the Jeffersonian democracy um, spirit, where we really have a government um, informed by the, or the, 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 the people out there who have jobs out in the real world who come to come uh, uh, to advise the government or be the government, um, and um, we don't have an aristocracy, we don't have an elite, we, we, we don't have a permanent class uh, 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 governing the country. The government really is of the people, uh, and, and this is, in, in our corner of the world, in, in the CFTC, um, I think that is embodied here in what we're doing and what, what, what this committee is, is about today. And in a larger context, in an era of um, great cynicism and distrust of government, um, uh, there's always been distrust in American history. It's part of our culture to distrust authority and going back to the revolution. And, and there's always been uh, somewhat uh, of, a, of an anti-elite, anti-Washington feeling. But I, I really do think it's stronger out there, out there today in, in the country. And, and I think the quantitative metrics about polls and, and public opinion show that. So we are living in a challenging time of great cynicism, great distrust of government. But my personal experience, and I've seen how the sausage is made. I mean, I was on Capitol Hill. I, I, I've seen how, how laws are made. I've seen, um, I've really been in the sausage factory. But having been in that factory and, and working at agencies like the CFTC and, and with my colleagues and, and with people like you and enterprises like this, I really come away with optimism. Um, I, I'm very optimistic for, for the, the future uh, of, of this country. It's based on my daily experience in a limited world at, at the CFTC, but it's forums like this and experiences like this and it's working with people uh, like you um, who, who really give, that, give me that, that fundamental optimism about the American spirit and the Amer American uh, character that uh, despite everything that's going on in our, in our country today and the division and the polarization and the cynicism and the challenges. Um, we're strong and, and the people in this country are strong and, and our government is strong. And um, I, I've been so fortunate to come to uh, work every day at a place like the CFTC and working with folks like you uh, to improve our financial markets, which we have done over the past uh, uh, two decades that uh, that I've been involved, um, and, and you look where we are today and the progress we've made, and it's been because of, of people at the CFTC and, and, and folks like yourself in, in, in the markets who, who, have, who have worked with Congress us and then implemented the laws and made our market stronger. I'm optimistic, and I, 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 it's just been fortunate to work, uh, work for this agency and sponsor the and, and I thank you all um, uh, so much for making that possible. Um, so, so thank you and, and good luck and I'll be following. Uh, I'll, I'll look forward to reading the report someday. Uh, so, so thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Rekulis. It's been a pleasure serving as the EMAC Secretary under your sponsorship and thank you for the opportunity. It's unfortunate that we weren't able to hold today's meeting in person, but I hope you can join us once again when we're able to host EMAC meetings in Commission's headquarters in the future. As an amendment to the roll call earlier in the meeting, I am stating for the record that EMAC member Derek Salmon of CME Group and associate members Paul Sissio of the Industrial Energy Consumers of America and Jeffrey Walker of ACES were in attendance. Thank you to all of the EMAC members and associate members for your participation at today's meeting. Please stay well and keep an eye out for future communications on the formation of the EMAC subcommittee. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>